Episode 70, Church History Part 26. The Crusades that began in the 11th century ended in the 13th century. The Crusaders captured Jerusalem from the Muslims in the 11th century, but by the 12th century, the Muslims had taken it back. In the 12th century, the Crusaders were trying to take back Jerusalem, but no success. Other things were happening as well. In 1123 AD, the first ecumenical Lateran Council introduced 22 canon laws. Here are a few. No one except a priest shall be promoted to the dignity of provost, archpriest, or dean. And no one shall be made an archdeacon unless he's a deacon. We absolutely forbid priests, deacons, and subdeacons to associate with concubines and women or to live with women other than such of necessity permitted, namely mother, sister, or aunt, or any such person concerning whom no suspicion could arise. Priests, deacons, and subdeacons could not be friends or associate with women unless it's a female family member. No archdeacon, archpriest, provost, or dean shall bestow on another the care of souls or the prebends of a church without the decision of the bishop. Indeed, as the sacred canons point out, the care of souls and the disposition of ecclesiastical property are vested in the authority of the bishop. If anyone should dare act contrary to this and aggregate to himself the power belonging to the bishop, let him be expelled from the church. We absolutely forbid that those who have been excommunicated by their own bishops be received into the communion by other bishops, abbots, and clerics. We forbid abbots and monks to impose public penances or forgive sins to visit the sick, to administer extreme unction, and to sing public masses. The chrism, the holy oil, consecration of altars, and ordination of clerics they shall obtain from the bishops in whose diocese they reside. The tax which monasteries and their churches have rendered to the bishops since the time of Gregory the Seventh shall be continued. We absolutely forbid abbots and monks to acquire by prescription after 30 years the possessions of churches and of shops. We absolutely forbid priests, deacons, subdeacons, and monks to have concubines or to contract marriage. We decree in accordance with the definitions of the sacred canons that marriages already contracted by such persons must be dissolved and that the persons be condemned to do penance. In 1139 AD, a second ecumenical Lateran Council canonized more laws, which repeated some of the canons in 1123, like forbidding marriage of the church leaders, but some new ones were added. Laity was excommunicated if they did not pay tithes to their bishops. Nuns were prohibited from singing the divine office in the same choir with the monks. All these rules had nothing to do with adhering to Yah, the teachings of Isaiah, or the Torah or Tula. But it was all their personal and corporate agendas in making the Roman Catholic Christian Church an empire to control and rule the masses. Why not just use the scriptures that are already there? But they chose to create their own laws and canonize those laws. Church leadership could not marry, so they could devote all their time to the church, which not only stopped heirs taking the throne, but it created an image of being pure to convince Christians and new converts to take their church positions seriously. Truth Wars is giving information for you to see firsthand where positions of authority like bishops and popes came from, as well as taxes and tithing, all man-made and a part of the Roman Catholic Christian Church because the Roman Empire and the Catholic Christian Church merged into one empire or system. In the 12th century, the cities grew as a papacy grew with literature, philosophy, science, arts, Christian conversions, trade, and architecture. 
1144 AD, the St. Denis Basilica of Abbot Suger was built and was the first major building in the style of Gothic architecture, as this basilica would hold the tombs of many French kings. In 1181 AD, St. Francis of Assisi was born to a wealthy Italian father and French mother. In 1207 AD, he began traveling and preaching and obtained approval from Pope Innocent III to form a new church in 1209 called the Franciscan or Medicant Orders within the Catholic Christian Church. St. Francis claimed to have heard the voice of Christ and was told to repair the Christian church and live a life of poverty. So he abandoned his life of luxury and became a devotee of the faith with his reputation spreading all over the Christian world. This is per biography.com. The original rule of St. Francis approved by the Pope did not allow ownership of property, requiring members of the order to beg for food while preaching because these rules of poverty were to follow the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. What? The last we checked, Isaiah was not poor, nor begging for anything. But of course, the teachings of Isaiah, the Torah, or Tula were not being adhered. We see now where this vow of poverty as a Christian came from. And these orders of St. Francis were approved by Pope Innocent III. And during this time of the 12th century, crusades were going on to recapture Jerusalem, as we discussed in episode 69. And even Pope Innocent led the Fourth Crusade, in which they did not take back Jerusalem. As the Franciscans poverty message was spreading, St. Dominic, a Spanish priest who followed the teachings of St. Augustine of Hippo, again the church father, began his medicant or begging message and his followers were called the Dominicans. The difference between the Franciscans and the Dominicans is that the Dominicans could actually own property. Dominique sent Matthew of Paris to establish a school near the University of Paris. This was the first of many Dominican schools established by the Brethren, some near large universities throughout Europe. The women of the order also established schools for the children of the local gentry. Dominique sent followers to the University Center of Paris and established a monastery for men and women focused on study and teaching. Universities of theology were being established with teachers from St. Dominic and teachers of St. Francis. Franciscans put their teachers in major universities across Western Europe. On November the 15th, 1215 AD, Pope Innocent III convened the Fourth Lateran Council, which was considered to be the most important church council of the Middle Ages. By its conclusion, it issued 70 reformatory decrees. Among other things, it encouraged creating schools and holding clergy to a higher standard than the laity. Professor Thomas Madden states, in the universities, if you were of say a middle class, and middle class was a fairly small class in the Middle Ages. You could send your son to the university with the concept that they would get a job with a bishop or in some other ecclesiastical capacities, they would pay well because the universities were created by the Catholic Church and designed to produce well-trained men for the Catholic Church. That's why all of the students would essentially take some kind of minor religious orders and would generally, when they graduated, go on to a role someplace. Some of this is still left over even today. If you go to a commencement exercise at a university and you look at what everyone's wearing, they're wearing clerical vestments. These would be the vestments that the clergy would wear as they took on the symbols of their investment of their degrees. It wasn't too long, particularly in the 13th century, before the kings wanted to start making use of these well-trained men in their own royal bureaucracies to use those same methods and that same education that was coming out of these universities. And now we see the foundation of how universities and colleges were established, which is in line with how they started with the church fathers and them establishing schools as well. KeenanPreppers.org states, the 13th century was in fact the high point of medieval life in Europe. The papacy had reached its greatest height of power. The medicant orders extended their tentacles in an attempt to convert the world to Catholicism. Catholic universities sprang up throughout Europe and became the foundation for the level of scholasticism we see today. 
Gothic art and architecture pushed boundaries, and the Christian world seemed to be united under one head. Not only are we seeing the foundation of the Christian church and their doctrines of submission to leadership and tithing, but we also see taxation, society divisions, and the foundation of our colleges and universities. In graduation ceremonies, we are wearing the Roman Catholic Christian church vestments. What? Toward the end of the 13th century, trade, taxation, and bank lending surged. The Barty family and the Peruzzi family were influential Florentine families that started powerful banking companies. Popes, nobles, bourgeoisies, towns, abbeys, and kings drew loans. These loans were high interest loans, and these loans would finance the king's wars, and these banks would help build monarchies. England, France, and Scandinavia countries became a single monarch. Spain and Grenada became one. Italy and Germany became one as well. These monarchies would want to do their own thing, which is why France installed their own pope to rival the sitting papacy. Changes would occur in the 14th century as a French monarchy gained strength. In 1309, Pope Clement V moved the papacy from Rome to Avignon, ushering in the period known as the Avignon Papacy, also known as the Babylonian Captivity. Chaos arose from the conflict between the papacy and the French crown. Confusion and corruption ran amok and money stopped flowing in. So the Avignon popes began to tax everything and everyone. And other popes saw the Avignon's rebellion against the papacy and began to do the same. Marsilius of Padua wrote a paper entitled The Defender of the Peace, which basically said the papacy should not control everything and democracy was a better and more peaceful route. The Italian College of Cardinals were filled with mostly Frenchmen, so the Romans stormed the election of the next Italian Pope, and as a result, Urban VI was elected the new Pope. The French Cardinals did not accept Pope Urban as they elected their own Pope named Clement VII. From the division and chaos came the great schism of the papacy. The two popes, Urban and Clement, did their own thing with their own cardinals. France, Scotland, Cyprus went with Clement. England, Ireland, Italy, and others went with Urban. Kingdompreppers.org states, With the death of Urban in 1389 AD, another pope replaced him. But in 1395, the idea of forming a general council to settle the schism was proposed by the professors of the University of Paris. Canon law, however, dictated that the Pope alone held the power to call a council of that nature, and he alone could ratify the decisions of one. Necessity forced the issue in a general council comprised of members of both colleges of cardinals met in 1409 to depose both rival popes and elect a new pope, Alexander V. The schism didn't end because other men were still trying to claim the office of the pope. But in 1414 AD, the Council of Constance resolved the issue. It elected Martin V, a pope who immediately disavowed the acts of the council with the exception of the vote that made him pope. In the mind of Martin V, no council must be allowed to wield power above that of the Pope. All in all, the Great Schism ended. But immorality and corruption would plague the papacy. Disdain for the papal office began to build, and the Protestant Reformation was stirring in the hearts of several men. One of those men is John Wycliffe, an English scholastic philosopher, theologian, biblical translator, reformer, priest, and seminary professor at the University of Oxford. In 1369 AD, Wycliffe attained his bachelor's degree in theology and his doctorate in 1372 AD. Thomas Bradwarden, the Archbishop of Canterbury, in his book On the Cause of God Against the Pelagians, a bold recovery of the Pauline Augustine doctrine of grace would greatly shape young Wycliffe's views for David Calhoun in the Morning Star of the Reformation. As the corruption in the church increased, the papacy moved from Rome to Avignon, and the Great Schism unfolded with Urban, Clement, and other popes vying to be the head of the papacy. And this made John Wycliffe question their actions 
and their privileged status of the clergy, which bolstered their powerful role in England and the luxury and the pomp of local parishes and their ceremonies. This is per Lacey Baldwin Smith in the Ram of the England. Wycliffe believed that if any clergy was found to be abusing their roles and offices, then their property should be confiscated. He believed the scriptures were the truth and man should rely on the Bible and not on popes or the clergy. He stressed predestination that enabled an invisible church elect made up of those predestined to be saved rather than the visible Catholic church for Britannica.com. Wycliffe believed no one who is eternally lost has part in the church. He said, there's one universal church and outside of there is no salvation. He refuted the Catholic church's idea that the bread and wine during communion transferred into the body and blood of Jesus. Wycliffe wrote his teachings down and advocated for them everywhere he went. His followers were called lay lords. Of course, Wycliffe's writings and teachings were condemned by the papacy and he was called a heretic. But the law lords carried the message of Wycliffe to as many who would listen. And even after Wycliffe's death in 1384 AD, his message had reached Prague. KeenanPreppers.org states, Despite his penchant for church reform due to evils practiced by the clergy, Wycliffe was guilty of benefiting from ecclesiastical appointments in return for his political service. He even refused to relinquish a few strongly held Catholic beliefs, such as the concept of purgatory and prayers offered up to supposed saints. And while he decried the practice of Christians relying on the ideas of respected theologians over that of scripture, he quoted heavily from the works of Augustine of Hippo. Nevertheless, John Wycliffe would be regarded as one of the beginning reformers of the Protestant Reformation that was to come in the 16th century. This is the history and foundation of the Roman Catholic Christian Church, where men are wanting power, control, and riches untold as they create their own laws and rules for everyone to follow except them. They're fighting and scheming to get their way, and if they couldn't get their way, they would make their own way. And it's promising to see men stand and speak up against the evil and corruption, but at the same time, we have to understand their history as well. Wycliffe seemed to be a good-hearted guy, but he was taught just like the rest of them with the teachings of the founding fathers of the church. Thus, they had to compete with scripture and with their foundational and educational beliefs taught from birth. Sadly, oftentimes those foundational and educational beliefs override scripture because man wants the power and the authority, which requires compromise. Case in point, Wycliffe, he believed in predestination, and we've learned that that was not a teaching of Isaiah, Matthew 6 and 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve Yah and Mammon. What is Mammon? Riches, money, possessions, property, power, authority. As we seek truth, please seek truth with us. Please send questions or comments to info at truthwars.com or come it here. We don't claim to know everything. We just seek the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that knows everything. Let truth roar. Let truth reign. Let truth speak. And let truth set you and your entire family free. Truth roars. Truth reigns. Truth speaks. To sets me free. Please see a podcast disclaimer at truthwars.com.